This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Plague Ship by Andre Norton. Chapter 9 Plague. Jellicoe and Steen Wilcox pored over the few notes Tao had made before he was stricken. But apparently the medic had found nothing to indicate that Sinbad was the carrier of any disease. Meanwhile, the captain gave orders for the cat to be confined. A difficult task, since Sinbad crouched close to the door of the storage cabin and was ready to dart out when food was taken in for him. Once he got a good way down the corridor before Dane was able to corner and return him to keeping. Dane, Ollie, and Weeks took on the full care of the four sick men, leaving the few regular duties of the ship to the senior officers, while Rip was installed in charge of the hydro garden. Mira, the first to be taken ill, showed no change. He was semi-conscious. He swallowed food, if it were put in his mouth, he responded to nothing around him. And Costi, Tau, and Van Ryck followed the same pattern. They still held morning inspection of those on their feet for signs of a new outbreak, but when no one else went down during the next two days, they regained a faint spark of hope. Hope which was snapped out when Ollie brought the news that Stotts could not be roused and must have taken ill during a sleep period. One more inert patient was added to the list, and nothing learned about how he was infected. Except that they could eliminate Sinbad, since the cat had been in custody during the time Stotts had apparently contracted the disease. Weeks, Ollie, and Dane, though they were in constant contact with the sick men, and though Dane had repeatedly handled Sinbad, continued to be immune. A fact, Dane thought more than once, which must have significance if someone with Tao's medical knowledge had been able to study it. By all rights, they should be the most susceptible, but the opposite seemed true. And Wilcox duly noted that fact among the data they had recorded. It became a matter of watching each other, waiting for another collapse. And they were not surprised when Tang Ya reeled into the mess his face livid and drawn with pain. Rip and Dane got him to his cabin before he blacked out. But all they could learn from him during the interval before he lost consciousness was that his head was bursting and he couldn't stand it. Over his limp body they stared at one another bleakly. Six down,' Ollie observed, "'and six to go. How do you feel?' "'Tired, that's all.' What I don't understand is that once they go into this stupor, they just stay. They don't get any worse, they have no rise in temperature. It's as if they're in a modified form of cold sleep. How is Tang? Rip asked from the corridor. Usual pattern, Ollie answered. He's sleeping. Got a pain, fella? Rip shook his head. Right as a comm unit. I don't get it. Why does it strike Tang, who didn't even hit dirt much, and yet you keep on? Dane grimaced. If we had an answer to that, maybe we'd know what caused the whole thing. Ollie's eyes narrowed. He was staring straight at the unconscious Comtech as if he did not see that supine body at all. I wonder if we've been salted, he said slowly. "'We've been what?' Dane demanded. "'Look here, we three, with weeks, drank that brew of the Salariki, didn't we? "'And we were as sick as Venusian gobblers afterwards,' agreed Rip. Light dawned. "'Do you mean—' began Dane. "'So that's it,' flashed Rip. "'It might just be,' Ollie said. 
Do you remember how the settlers on Cambline brought their Terran cattle through the first year? They fed them salt mixed with fancel grass. The result was that the herds didn't take the fancel grass fever when they turned them out to pasture in the dry season. All right, maybe we had our salt in that drink. The fancel salt makes the cattle filthy sick when it's forced down their throats, but after they recover, they're immune to the fever. And nobody on Cambline buys on salted cattle now. It sounds logical, admitted Rip. But how are we going to prove it? Ollie's face was black once more. Probably by elimination, he said morosely. If we keep our feet and all the rest go down, that's our proof. But we ought to be able to do something, protested Shannon. Just how? Ollie's slender brows arched. Do you have a gallon of that celeriki brew on board you can serve out? We don't know what was in it. Nor are we sure that this whole idea has any value. All of them had had first aid and basic preventive medicine as part of their training. But the more advanced laboratory experimentation was beyond their knowledge and skill. Had Tao still been on his feet, Perhaps he could have traced that lead and brought order out of the chaos which was closing in upon the Solar Queen. But, though they reported their suggestion to the captain, Jellicoe was powerless to do anything about it. If the four who had shared that upsetting friendship cup were immune to the doom which now overhung the ship, there was no possible way for them to discover why or how. Ship's time came to have little meaning, and they were not surprised when Steen Wilcox slipped from his seat before the computer, to be stowed away with what had become a familiar procedure. Only Jellicoe withstood the contagion apart from the younger four, taking his turn at caring for the helpless men. There was no change in their condition. They neither roused nor grew worse as the hours and then the days sped by. But each of those units of time in passing brought them nearer to greater danger. Sooner or later they must make the transition out of hyper into system space, and the jump out of warp was something not even a veteran took lightly. Rip's round face thinned while they watched. Jellicoe was still functioning. But if the captain collapsed, the whole responsibility for the snap-out would fall directly on Shannon. An infinitesimal error would condemn them to almost hopeless wandering, perhaps forever. Dane and Ollie relieved Rip of all duty but that which kept him chained in Wilcox's chair before the computers. He went over and over the data of the course the astrogator had set. And Captain Jellicoe, his eyes sunk in dark pits, checked and rechecked. When the fatal moment came, Ollie manned the engine room with Weeks at his elbow to tend the controls the acting engineer could not reach. And Dane, having seen the sick all safely stowed in crash webbing, came up to the control cabin, riding out the transfer in Tang Ya's place. Rip's voice hoarsened into a croak, calling out the data. Dane, though he had had basic theory, was completely lost before Shannon had finished the first set of coordinates. But Jellicoe replied, hands playing across the pilot's board. Stand by for snap-out. The croak went down to the engines where Ollie now held Stoltz's post. Engines ready, the voice came back, thinned by its journey from the Queen's interior. Ought five nine, that was Jellicoe. Dane found himself suddenly unable to watch. He shut his eyes and braced himself against the vertigo of snap-out. It came, and he whirled sickeningly through unstable space. Then he was sitting in the laced Comtex seat, looking at Rip. Runnels of sweat streaked Shannon's brown face. There was a damp patch darkening the tunic between his shoulder-blades, a patch which it would take both of Dane's hands to cover. For a moment he did not raise his head to look at the vision plate which would tell him whether or not they had made it. But when he did, familiar constellations made the patterns they knew. They were out, and they couldn't be too far off the course Wilcox had plotted. 
There was still the system run to make, but Snap-Out was behind them. Rip gave a deep sigh and buried his head in his hands. With a throb of fear, Dane unhooked his safety belt and hurried over to him. When he clutched at Shannon's shoulder, the astrogator apprentice's head rolled limply. Was Rip down with the illness, too? But the other muttered and opened his eyes. "'Does your head ache?' Dane shook him. "'Head? No,' Rip's words came drowsily. "'Just sleepy. So sleepy.' He did not seem to be in pain, but Dane's hands were shaking as he hoisted the other out of his seat and half carried, half led him to his cabin, praying as he went that it was only fatigue and not the disease. The ship was on auto now until Jellicoe as pilot set a course. Dane got Rip down on the bunk and stripped off his tunic. The fine-drawn face of the sleeper looked wan against the foam rest, and he snuggled into the softness like a child as he turned over and curled up. But his skin was clear. It was real sleep and not the plague which had claimed him. Impulse sent Dane back to the control cabin. He was not an experienced pilot officer, but there might be some assistance he could offer the captain now that Rip was washed out, perhaps for hours. Jellico hunched before the smaller computer, feeding pilot tape into its slot. His face was a skull under a thin coating of skin, the bones marking it sharply at jaw, nose, and eye socket. Shannon down. His voice was a mere whisper of its powerful self. He did not turn his head. "'He's just worn out, sir,' Dane hastened to give reassurance. "'The marks aren't on him.' "'When he comes around, tell him the coards are in,' Jellicoe murmured. "'See, he checks the course in ten hours.' "'But, sir,' Dane's protest failed as he watched the captain struggle to his feet, pulling himself up with shaking hands. As Thorson reached forward to steady the other, one of those hands tore at tunic collar, ripping loose the ceiling. There was no need for explanation. The red splotch signaled from Jellicoe's sweating throat. He kept his feet, holding out against waves of pain by sheer willpower. Then Dane got a grip on him, got him away from the computer, hoping he could keep him going until they reached Jellicoe's cabin. Somehow they made that journey, being greeted with raucous screams from the Hubat. Furiously Dane slapped the cage, setting it to swinging, and so silencing the creature which stared at him with round malignant eyes as he got the captain to bed. Only four of them on their feet now, Dane thought bleakly as he left the cabin. If Rip came out of it in time, they could land. Dane's breath caught as he made himself face up to the fact that Shannon might be ill, that it might be up to him to bring the Queen in for a landing. And in where? The Terra Quarantine was Luna City on the moon, but let them signal for a set down there, let them describe what had happened, and they might face death as a plague ship. Wearily he climbed down to the mess cabin to discover Weeks and Ollie there before him. They did not look up as he entered. "'Old man's got it,' he reported. "'Rip?' was Allie's crossing question. Asleep, he passed out. "'What?' Weeks swung around. "'Worn out,' Dane amended. Captain fed in a pilot tape before he gave up. "'So, now we are three, was Ollie's comment. "'Where do we set down, Luna City?' If they let us, Dane hinted at the worst. But they've got to let us, Weeks exclaimed. We can't just wander around out here. It's been done, Ollie reminded them brutally, and that silenced Weeks. Did the old man set Luna? After a long pause, Ollie inquired. I didn't check, Dane confessed. He was giving out, and I had to get him to his bunk. It might be well to know, the engineer apprentice got up, his movements lacking much of the elastic spring which was normally his. When he climbed to control, both the others followed him. All these slender fingers played across a set of keys, and in the small screen mounting on the computer, 
a set of figures appeared. Dane took up the master course book, read the connotation, and blinked. Not Luna? Ollie asked. No, but I don't understand. This must be for somewhere in the asteroid belt. Ollie's lips stretched into a pale caricature of a smile. Good for the old man. He still had his wits about him, even after the bug bit him. But why are we going to the asteroids? Weeks asked, reasonably enough. There are medics at Luna City. They can help us. They can handle known diseases, Ollie pointed out. But what of the code? Weeks dropped into the Comtex place as if some of the stiffening had vanished from his thin but sturdy legs. They wouldn't do that, he protested. But his eyes said that he knew that they might. They well might. Oh, no? Face the facts, man. Ollie sounded almost savage. We come from a frontier planet. We're a plague ship. He did not have to underline that. They all knew too well the danger in which they now stood. Nobody's died yet. Weeks tried to find an opening in the net being drawn about them. And nobody's recovered. Ollie crushed that thread of hope. We don't know what it is, how it is contracted, anything about it. Let us make a report saying that, and you know what will happen, don't you? They weren't sure of the details, but they could guess. So I say, Ollie continued, the old man was right when he set us on an evasion course. If we can stay out until we really know what is the matter, we'll have some chance of talking over the high brass at Luna when we do plan it. In the end, they decided not to interfere with the course the captain had set. It would take them into the fringes of solar civilization, but give them a fighting chance at solving their problem before they had to report to the authorities. In the meantime, they tended their charges, let Rip sleep, and watched each other with desperate but hidden intentness, ready for another to be stricken. However, they remained although almost stupid with fatigue at times, reasonably healthy. Time was proving that their guess had been correct. They had been somehow inoculated against the germ or virus which had struck the ship. Rip slept for twenty-four hours, ship time, and then came into the mess cabin ravenously hungry, to catch up on both food and news and he refused to join with the prevailing pessimistic view of the future. Instead, he was sure that their own immunity having been proven, they had a talking point to use with the medical officers at Luna, and he was eager to alter course directly for the quarantine station. Only the combined arguments of the other three made him, unwillingly, agree to a short delay. And how grateful they should be for Captain Jellicoe's foresight they learned within the next day. Ollie was at the comm unit, trying to pick up Solarian news reports. When the red alert flashed on throughout the ship, it brought the others hurrying to the control cabin. The code squeaks were magnified as Ollie switched on the receiver full strength, to be translated as he pressed a second button. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Free Trader, Solar Queen, Terra Registry, 65724910 JK, Suspected Plague Ship, Took Off from Infected Planet, Warn Off, Warn Off, Report Such Ship to Luna Station, Solar Queen from Infected Planet, To Be Warned Off and Reported. The same message was repeated three times before going off ether. The four in the control cabin looked at each other blankly. But, Dane broke the silence, how did they know? We haven't reported in. The Izies, Ollie had the answer ready. That IS ship must be having the same sort of trouble and reported to her company. They would include us in their report and believe that we were infected too. Or it would be easy to convince the authorities that we were. I wonder, Rip's eyes narrowed slits as he leaned back against the wall. Look at the facts. The survey ship which charted Sargal, 
they were dirt side there about three, four months. Yet they give it a clean bill of health and put it up for trading rights auction. Then Cam bought those rights. He made at least two trips in and out before he was blasted on limbo. No infection bothered him or survey. But you've got to admit it hit us, Weeks protested. Yes, and the Izzy ship was able to foresee it, report us before we snapped out of hyper. Sounds almost as if they expected us to carry a plague, doesn't it? Shannon wanted to know. Planted? Ollie frowned at the banks of controls. But how? No Izzy came on board, no Salaric either, except for the cub who showed us what they thought of catnip. Rip shrugged. How would I know how they did? He was beginning when Dane cut in. If they didn't know about our immunity, the Queen might stay in hyper and never come out. There wouldn't be anyone to set the snap out. Right enough. But on the chance that somebody did keep on his feet and bring her home, they were ready with a cover. If no one raises a howl, Sargal will be written off the charts as infected. I.S. sits on her tail fins a year or so, and then she promotes an investigation before the board. The survey records are trotted out, no infection recorded. So they send in a patrol probe. Everything is all right. So it isn't the planet after all. It was that dirty old free trader. And she's out of the way. I.S. gets the Koros trade all square and legal, and we're no longer around to worry about. Need as a Sadariki netcast, and right around our collective throats, my friends. So, what do we do now? Weeks wanted to know. We keep on the old man's course. Get lost in the asteroids until we can do some heavy thinking and see a way out. But if I.S. gave us this prize package, some trace of its origin is still aboard. And if we can find out, why... Then we have something to start from. Mura went down first, and then Carl. Nothing in common, the old problem faced Dane for the hundredth time. No, but... Ollie arose from his place at the commune. I'd suggest a real search of first Frank's and then Carl's quarters. A regular turnout down to the bare walls of their cabins. Are you with me? Fly boy, we're ahead of you. Rip contributed, already at the door panel. Down to the bare walls it is. End of chapter 9